Well, before we get going, um, you know, this is not a, a, um, a fun subject, suffering and trial and tribulation. It's not. I started last week, and you know, we went over, uh, we set a kind of a foundation um, scripturally about it. So if you didn't um, get a chance to, to kind of be a part of that, it's, it'll probably be online. It might be online already, I don't know. Um, laid kind of a foundation, just biblically, about it. And then we just mentioned three points, you know, one being um, discipling. It's, it's a great discipling tool when you go through struggle. And the other one is to learn perseverance. And you don't get stronger unless you put more weight on the bar. You know, you've heard all these things secondly. What, what doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. It's basic. And then the other one that was really important, I think, was to enlarge our ministry. Because he who suffers much speaks many languages. And so God doesn't use it for naught. We're, we're able to minister to other people because it's never going to stop. Um, the Judeo-Christian philosophy is that from Genesis 3, things started to spiral down. And they will not spiral up. I mean, they, they spiral up from time to time. Obviously, for a born-again believer, we have a blessed hope. But still, we're still dying and still spiraling down. It will not spiral up until Yeshua touches down on the Mount of Olives. Okay, that's, that's when it spirals up. And that's, that's, that's just the biblical truth. Um, there's been such a, you know, this, this prosperity doctrine, sadly enough, has seeped into so many denominations. Even denominations that were really strong on the word and really tough, and they just thought, you know, we're losing people. You know, we got to sell seats, and this isn't, that's, it's just, it's bothersome to me. It's, it's, it, you have no idea how bothersome it is to me, because not only do I think it's preaching another gospel, which is, which is, you know, dangerous, and, and it could be a doctrine of demons almost, from what I see sometimes, okay, I got to call it like I sees it, um, but for the people who are struggling, there's, there's, there's no ministry in that. I don't, I don't, look, some of you are just, maybe you got an answer to prayer. Maybe you just got into a college, you're a young kid that you've wanted to go to all your life. Maybe you just got married and there's great joy in that. And I'm, I'm so happy for you, you have no idea. Because the happier you are, the happier you make me. You follow? So I'm happy, I'm happy in general. I don't know if you're like me, but I could be, I could be with my kids uh, on a beach, having the time of my life. And then seeing a guy in a wheelchair with one leg, and I'm done. Is anybody like that? Yes. I'm done. And I, 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 have to, I have to go over to him. I don't know. And I, I, sometimes I've embarrassed myself. Sometimes I make the person uncomfortable. But I feel like I've just got to go over and go, is there anything I could do? Can I pray? And sometimes, yes, they've gotten mad and said a few choice words. But, but, but I don't besides just feeling bad or besides making maybe waking me up and making me thankful for the moment if I'm complaining I just don't think it's enough because again I feel like that's just selfish but because people struggle and it's not just like I told you last week it's not just believers think well I, the enemy's targeting me it rains on the just and the unjust and the rain is beheld on the just and the unjust it does not matter if you don't believe in God you're living in a sinful world and and there's debris everywhere and you could be an innocent bystander and get hit by some of the debris. You know, how many innocent people are driving along and gets T-boned by somebody who's intoxicated? And it just happens. And it happens all the time. And when we think it can happen to us, I think that's dangerous. If, we, if we're preoccupied with it's going to happen to us, that's dangerous too. There has to be some kind of happy medium. So understand, the Bible clearly says rejoice with those who are rejoicing and mourn with those who are mourning. Very few people can do both. If they're rejoicing and you bring them bad news, like, I don't want to hear it, man. I'm rejoicing. That's not really Yeshua. I'm sorry. I know that might be a little offensive, but it's not. You know, also, if you're going through a tough time and somebody got good news, it's not fair for you to go, well, I don't, I don't want to hear about your good news because I'm struggling. That's not really good either. So understand, if, if you're going through a great time or life is good right now and you're celebrating that, I'm happy for you. Yes. Totally. <laughs> What kind of nut would not be happy for somebody who's, who's enjoying? But if you're struggling and, you know, I just want to read you one email of, of many that we get. Um, I got this um, the other day. Uh, I got it Thursday. And this guy writes, Shalom Rabbi Greg, what a gutsy guy you are. 
I knew this guy was Jewish right away. I, I, seriously, I knew, and, and he is. I could tell from his last name. Um, what a gutsy guy you are to preach a message like that, meaning suffering. I'm so sick of hearing pastors doling out apple pie and ice cream every Sunday. Hypergrace reigns. You know what hypergrace means? It's, it's what you, hyper is, is over the top, okay? Um, hyperactive is, is overactive. Hypergrace is where you just talk grace. And, and it's not the message. It's part of the message. But Jude was writing a letter to the 12 tribes. He's writing a letter to all the Jewish believers. And he said, you know, I wanted to write to you and encourage you, but I've got to write about this. And he wrote about grace abuse. Yes. It's, it's abusive when you just think, well, God will love me no matter what. Oh, you know, the Lord told me that I need to divorce my wife. Yeah, the Lord of the rings, maybe. <laughs> but not the Lord of the Bible. Hyper grace reigns, and it does. And I'm not singling out anything, but it's almost like pastors today, like if they, if they preach a message that's a little tough, just a little tough, they come back next week and they apologize. They say, I'm so sorry. You, you got, I don't go to church, but I know because I have some friends. They apologize, and then they teach this hyper grace message. Listen, John Wesley could not get a job today in his denomination. Jonathan Edwards could not get a job. Charles Spurgeon, it'd be tough. I mean, you might have some country church with 20 people where the guy's going for it, but he's not going to fill the seats like that. No, very, very afraid to offend anybody and making sure that everybody is just happy. But what if you're struggling? Then you don't go because you feel like you're the only one. And then you even, worse, you might feel like, why am I cursed? What am I doing wrong? We're not in an affluent area. I'm not in Buckhead. You know, we're not in an affluent area where everybody drives up, you know, with a brand new car and everybody's doing well and everybody's got their summer home and there's this and that and they just want to hear a nice, you know, it's not like that. And, And for whatever reason, Messianic Judaism attracts people that didn't fit in anywhere else. I've been doing this a long time. I mean, I called it Beth Yeshua because it's, it's Yeshua's house, but we could have called it Beth Granola because we have every fruit, flake, and nut. Um, yeah, how many people have told me over the years, you know, Rabbi, I've never really fit in, but, but here I do. And I'm like, wow, that's scary. He said a couple of points really got my attention, and he mentioned two. One person in 13 years has come to tell you that they're leaving? Wherever he is, he's up north. He goes, same up here. There's no difference between the north and the south, guys. Just because you fry everything doesn't mean there's any difference. Okay? You're no different than people in the north. Do you know why? You're no different if you're black. I don't care about your culture. Your culture is just how you express yourself in maybe food and dress. That doesn't mean nothing to me. Your heart is human. Up north, your heart is human. Up south, And we have a problem with the flesh. That is not a southern problem. That is not a northern problem. That is not a problem in India. But where I go, you have to understand. You have to understand me. I go to places where I see people starving in the street, dying in the street. That's where I go. So that's been my, that's been the way I've been marinated. And I grew up in the low-income housing project where there was just poverty everywhere. So, so you just got to understand that's the way I'm kind of marinated. So, so, so just understand that. He says, um, same up here, believers or, what they, or whatever they are, are taught to take the easy way out. God forbid confrontation. The Holy Spirit's going to confront you every day of your life if you are walking with the Lord. Every day of your life, the Holy Spirit will confront you. Every day. Yeshua was incredibly confrontational because without confrontation, there can be no growth. It's not like I want to believe me. Believe me, I'd much rather hand out gifts in the hood on December 24th. I've done it many times. But it's, it's not... It says here, obey your leaders and submit to them. This is the book of Hebrews. For they keep watch over your lives as people who will have to render account. Meaning if you're a leader in your house as a parent, you're going to have to render an account to God. If you're a leader in business you're going to have to, and a believer, you're going to have to render an account for God. In this, in this forum, I have to render an account for everything I taught or did not teach. There's things you don't know what I haven't taught. Because I didn't teach him, but what if God wanted me to teach him? I'm going to have to answer for that. Every idle, every idle word. It says, so make it a task of joy for them, not of groaning, for that is no advantage to you. Because if you make it of groaning for me, you've got to render an account. 
It's just one of those things. See, it, it's such a kind of a miserable job that the benefit is, if you give me a hard time, maybe I can sit there and watch God say, what were you thinking? So, so if it, it also says in Thessalonians, submit to those who confront you. They say to confront you to change. If there's no confrontation, if you and I together, you and I together, you and I together, you and I together, and we're friends, and I say everything you want me to say, and you say everything I want you to say, and we have that relationship, it's, it's beautiful, but we'll never change. And I'm, I'm, I, you know you got to change. I know I got to change. I know, but listen to me. Nobody in this place knows they have to change more than me. Nobody. I sit with the Lord every day of my life and take stock and inventory of where I am, where I'm not. How was this right? Did I say that right? Lord, I probably should have said it that way. Why did you let me? You didn't, I didn't feel you holding me back. Why? I do this every single day. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Saying that to you, go, what a great guy. Believe me, I'm not saying that. I'm saying this and being totally transparent so you too can be transparent. So you too can be regular in who you are. Yeah, there's things that people aren't going to like and there's things that we're not going to like about you and vice versa. And there's some things we need to overlook and there's some things we just need to change. And and that's between you and God. But just be yourself, man. You know, no act, no fronts. It's, It's not good and it's not healthy. But confrontation, he says, no confrontation. He says, what Jesus is the church teaching these days? And he said, you mentioned that Yeshua spoke suffering 25% of the time, which is true. He says, what's that? No, no, no. We've been saved by grace. No more suffering. Really? That's how he ends his... his... You know... Well, on that note, let's embark, Okay. Let me give you my personal top three list because there are probably books written on the subject. I've never read them. I've read very few books. If, if you ever want to come into my office, I'll escort you in there and you'll see my library and you'll be thoroughly unimpressed. I have a bunch of Bibles, Aramaic, a bunch of Bibles, and Greek, and Telinia, a bunch of Bibles, and I have a few books like Martyrs, Jesus Freaks, that kind of stuff. That's what I read. I don't really read theological books because I'm afraid if the theology is not right, I'll marinate in it and it'll become my theology. I get my theology from a concordance, the Bible, and the Holy Spirit. That's my trio. Because, you know, if you read an interpretive Bible, where'd they get it from? They must have, right? They must have been depending on the same thing. All they had, right? So, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm just saying be careful. Be careful because what you read, you marinate in. So I'm, very, I'm just very careful. Okay, this is my personal top three list about suffering, okay? So let's look at number one. Ephesians 5.1 says, so imitate God as his dear children. To me, suffering helps you become more godlike. And we all, we all want to become more godlike, right? More Yeshua-like, more godlike, whatever term you, you're comfortable with. We all want to be more godlike, right? This is the beautiful thing about this that crosses all denominational lines. It does not matter. It does not matter. Catholic to charismatic and anything in between, every single denomination, every single place in the universe, every single church or synagogue that believes in Yeshua, every single one, we can all say, yes, we should become more godlike. Right? We can all agree on this. Okay, Ephesians is just a letter written to a little congregation, a little port congregation where there was a lot of activity, and it's all about the body of Messiah. If you ever want to read a letter that's all about the body, that's the letter. It has nothing to do with the head, that's Colossians. There's all about the body, and one thing they stress in it is unity. The other thing they stress in it is being equipped for ministry, but overall, it's to become more godlike. That's what we're supposed to. Now, look at this word imitate for a minute. It's, and and by the way, you read in the scripture, it says, so, right? Go back to that for a second. I I just want you to really, uh, when you read, I don't want you to gloss over anything. what, so imitate God, so, so that's, a, that's a connection to what? Well, Ephesians 4.32, they didn't, when Paul wrote this letter, he didn't go, this is going to be the 32nd sentence of the fourth chapter. I'm going to take a break, then I'm going to come back. Yeshua didn't go, now Matthew 7.1, he didn't do that. People put those in there many years later, centuries later, why? For the purposes of teaching. Because nobody would be able to find these scriptures because nobody knows the Bible by heart. 
So it's just for teaching purposes, markers, which is, which is good. But you have to read in context. You can't break it up by chapter. The reason why it's connected to 432 is he says, based on the fact that God has forgiven us, that he's been incredibly kind, yeah. we should imitate God, meaning we should forgive others and be kind as well and tenderhearted. That's the connection. But I just want you to see this word, imitate, okay? Mimitase, what, what word do you think we get in our language? Mimic, but in a good way, not da 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 I can't stand that. Um, so mimic in a good way, to follow by example and to resemble. We're made in God's image. The Hebrew word is zelem. It's like a photocopy. Now, I don't know what Yeshua looked like. In fact, the Bible clearly says, Isaiah says, he wasn't anything to look at. They didn't say that about Saul. Saul was statuesque. Right? David's son Absalom was so beautiful with flowing locks. Right? They talk about that beauty. Even... Do you think this is something new, exterior beauty, that people focus on? Guys, the human condition has been around since the human being was created. Nothing's changed. Cain killed his brother because his father liked him more. That's crazy, man. That's crazy to be so jealous to kill your own brother. Nothing's new under the sun. Nothing is new under the sun. So we're supposed to resemble, not outwardly, not outwardly at all. We're supposed to resemble God's heart, all right? To be like. That's what it means. To, we're supposed to be like God. God-like, Messiah-like. You've heard the word. Whatever, that's why it's important to study his life. And all we have is the Gospels. So we study his life, and we figure out what he did. You know, remember that bracelet, what would Jesus do? I'll tell you, he wouldn't spend 12 bucks on that bracelet. Because this is a guy who, who multiplied the fish and the loaves, right? And he still said, pick up the spares. He could have multiplied again. Why did he say that? Because he was a great steward, because waste not, want not. Amen. I'm a big fan of that. You might think it's crazy, but there's a reason why we're not in debt. I come here Saturday afternoon, after everything's shut down, and make sure the air conditioning's off. Why? Why waste it? Amen. It's, it's human. They, 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 sometimes they mean well, but they, they miss a room. Not out of malice, they just start talking to somebody they miss. Well, if that thing's on all Saturday afternoon, all Saturday night, all Sunday, all Sunday night, maybe if I get here late Monday and it's a, it's a waste, right? You don't do it at your house, why should we do it at God's house? So it's just being a good steward to be like. Now, you know Michelangelo, one of the greatest artists ever? It's not Michelangelo, by the way, it's Michelangelo. You know, you've heard of him? Sistine Chapel, he's really popular. Um, as Michelangelo approached a huge block of marble, somebody asked him, what do you see? Quote, he said, I see a beautiful form trapped inside, and it is simply my responsibility to take my mallet and chisel and chip away until the figure is set free. Let, let me read it to you again because I think it's worth it. When he approached this big, massive block of marble, Michelangelo, what do you, what do you see? So they, he's looking, he's seeing something, right? You have to have the vision. He said, I see a beautiful form trapped inside, and it's my responsibility to take my mallet and chisel and chip away until it's free. There is no question in my mind that when we were born again, it was just the beginning. All we were was a big block of marble. But God saw, because he is the ultimate artist. He is the creator. And he said, I see something in that Hirschberg kid. There's something in there. I just got to chip away till I set him free. And that's all of us. I mean, I think up in heaven, there is a huge mallet with Greg Hirschberg's name on it. Really? <laughs> Might want to lay off the Irish coffees first thing in the morning, sweetheart. <laughs> anyway, getting back to the mallet. <laughs> Suffering, I know, listen, I'm telling you. I'm telling you because I've, I've suffered greatly with physical pain. For, for 10 years, I had sublock vertebrae and back pain all the time. 
and I was an athlete's athlete. That was my love, and that was my passion, and, and nobody did it more. And I would just be playing ball, and my back would go out, and literally I'd crawl. I'd crawl. Did anybody know what, when your back, do you know that pain? Ten years, and somebody prayed over me, and, and it subsided greatly. Then I went ten years with massive migraines. Anybody have migraines? Now, you're talking to a guy that won't take an aspirin. I'm a lunatic. My wife thinks I'm nuts. So 10 years, massive head pain, and it would happen almost every day. And I just grinned and, and bared. And now I have, a, a, you know, massive pain about something else, but it's been going on since 25, and I'm 58. And um, so I know about that. And, and anyway, suffering, though, chips away at our pride. Right? When all's, when all's going well, we get stupid, don't we? Right? Chips away at our pride. It, it chips away at our self-centeredness. Yes? It, it chips away at our complaining. You know when you're complaining and all of a sudden you're complaining because, because, and then all of a sudden something happens and you realize it wasn't so bad? Chips away, complaining. It, it chips away at our covetedness. I've never understood that one. I, I just don't understand that one. What's it to you? If somebody gets a house or whatever. What? I've never had a problem unless they ask me to make the payment. <laughs> it, it chips away at thanklessness, yes. which, which is sad. It chips away at discon discontent. Not just being satisfied. Yes. And, and this is just to name a few. I'm just naming some obvious ones. You, you probably have a big list. Yielding to God mm. may not change our circumstances, but it will absolutely change us. Yes. And, you know, Yeshua learned obedience by the things he suffered. Think about that. The Son of God. The Son of God learned obedience by the things he suffered. Um, number, number two, let me show you number two. I won't have you here too long today. <laughs> look, look, look. <laughs> <laughs> two is... And this is huge, the opportunity to glorify God and silence the enemy. You know, the first time I went to a friend's church and they were playing Matt Redman's song. You know, Matt Redman left England. He couldn't uh, make a living. That's how, how few churches there are now. And um, Matt Redman left and, and um, that was his song. And there's a backstory to it that I won't tell you. And um, they were playing it in this church and all the kids were jumping up and down. And I said to the pastor, I said, they don't know what this song is about. Because it's almost, it sounds, it sounds happy, right? This is my song. He give and take. A... He, he was singing that in response to losing his 10 children. Isn't it amazing how people don't even know the backstory to the songs? With, give and take, you know, it sounds cute. Um, but it's not cute. It's incredibly intense, and that's what I want to talk about. When you suffer... Or you go through a trial or a tribulation, you have an opportunity. This, guys, this is not easy. What I'm sharing with you, I have to preempt this. This is not easy. Don't feel like you're competing with another believer. Don't feel like if, you, if, if we fail, we're no good. Please don't. Please don't. I do not want to be responsible for that. This is the toughest thing to do in the universe. Nothing is tougher than this, okay? So you have the beginning of Job, the oldest book supposedly written. Adonai asked the adversary, so the Lord is speaking to the devil. Quote, did you notice my servant Eov? There's no one like him on earth. I, I'm sure if, if Job was there, he would have been like, Job did have fears, because don't you see every time their kids had a party, he sacrificed. Yes. Yes. The sacrificial system wasn't up, but he knew that there was something, power, in the blood of an animal. Yes. 
to sacrifice an innocent victim just in case his kids sinned. He was constantly, constantly, great, a great dad, but constantly worried about his children. Adonai asked the adversary, did you notice my servant Eov? There's no one like him on earth. Listen to what he says. He's a blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil. God is saying that he's Tom. This is in Hebrew. He's morally innocent. He has integrity. He adheres to my moral and ethical principles. And then he says he's Yesha. He's straight and he's right. Wouldn't you love for God to think that about you? Maybe not the part where he's speaking to the adversary, right? (laughs) Not so much that part, maybe. But it's just, I just want to pay tribute to him. What a a man of God. You know, I'm just so unbelievably impressed. Not that he needs me to be impressed, but I, I want to speak of him in a great light. He deserves it. The adversary answered Adonai. I You know, maybe I should tell you, um, well... I shouldn't tell you anything. You're telling me, right? You're telling me because I I was just going to read it. and You said, go back. Okay. So Job um, and the devil here, do you remember when he says, where did you come from? And the devil says, to and fro? Meaning, I'm here and there, which means he can't be everywhere. Just know that. He's not omnipresent. If he's here... He can't be there. Don't give him more power than he deserves. Okay? He does not know everything. He knows what you speak, so be careful what you speak, because once you speak, he'll know it, and he'll use it against you in a court of law. Not only that, he's always going to and fro, and what is he trying to do? He's looking for a soul to steal. The devil went down to Georgia one night. (laughs) I think he stayed a while, I'm just saying. (laughs) But he's looking for a soul to steal. Your soul is the seat of your emotions. He's looking to steal your emotions away from God. If he can get you to curse God, he's pumped. That's his goal. He can't steal your salvation. And he can't fight with God. You know how long that lasted, right? Right? For years, maybe centuries, thousands of years, he's politicking. He gets a third of the angels. And he said, I will make my throne greater than your ship. Gone. That's how long that fight lasted. Gone. He just fell from that. He was the highest cherub. Over. He's like, what what the? So he can't get God. All he can do is what punks do, what bullies do. They go after your favorite possessions. I remember when I got my first car and I had a little problem with some guys in the neighborhood. Well, what'd they do? They keyed it up. They couldn't key me up, so they keyed the car up. With the car. And Satan's looking to key us up. So he's looking for a soul to steal, the seat of your emotions, your decision maker. If he could steal your decisions away from praising God, he's pumped. Okay, so that's, the, that's, that's what happened a few verses before. And then he says, did you consider, and then listen what the adversary says. Such a... Man, I I, I hate him as much as I love God. The adversary answered, I don't know, is it for nothing that Eov fears you? You hear what he's saying? He's blessed. He's rich. He's got 10 healthy kids. Be careful when you boast about those things. His kids were his idol. His stuff was his idol. I'm not putting him down. I'm just telling you the truth. He was an incredible, incredible man. But he idolized those things, sadly enough. I idolized my health. I ate perfectly, and I was a competitive try. I competed in everything you could possibly compete in. Competitive, competitive, and the awards and the thing. And then my body started to fall apart. I mean, I didn't even, I didn't even drink. I never smoked. I juiced. I, did, I ate organic way before. I was going to health food stores when everybody in the health food store looked like they were dying. Does anybody remember those days when it smelled like a menagerie in a circus and everybody just looked like they were on their last leg? Can I have more sesame seeds? Everybody looked like they were dying. Now everybody's eating it, right? But we were doing it way long ago and always healthy and always healthy. And then aneurysms and and everything falling apart in the body. 
every tendon, every ligament, everything hurting? Crazy. But it was my idol. It was my idol, so God chipped away. And I say it smiling, but I'm not that happy about it. It hurts. It hurts. It's painful. But he's saying, is it for nothing? I mean, you've blessed them. You've put a protected head. I can't get to him. You know, he's just, you're hanging on to him, man. I can't get at him. I've tried. You won't let me. You notice that Satan doesn't have as much power. He's not omnipotent because if he did, he would have got to him. Most of us say, oh, it's Satan. No, it's bad life choices, pal. Satan didn't put you in that financial condition. You did. You quit your job, you got six kids, and you have no backup plan. It's Satan. No, it was a stupid decision. If he could attack as much as we think he could attack, he'd be attacking us right now. You put a protective hedge around him, his house, and everything he has. Totally protected. You've prospered his work. He's crazy blessed. His livestock spread all over. You've blessed him every which way. Is there a saying every which way but Sunday? Every which way but what? Loose. Every which way but loose? Why are you interrupting me? I want to drink some water. What do you think, this is interactive? <laughs> You've prospered his work and his livestock and spread out all over the land. But if you reach out your hand and touch whatever he has, you notice he's saying, but if you reach out your hand. Not if I. Wow, that changes a lot of theology. So you mean God did? Don't you see in Chronicles, he said, if I send the disease. It's all God. Satan's a non-issue. It's all God. It's all God. All you got to do is focus on God. But if you reach out your hand and touch whatever he has, without a doubt, he'll curse you to your face. That's so antagonistic. It's just so unbelievably antagonistic. He's suggesting that the only reason Job fears the Lord is because all is well. The enemy is basically saying, remove the hedge and Job will show his true colors. But this is true of some. Take away their prosperity and you take away their religion. I mean, why else? In the, I mean, in the, in the Great Depression of 1929, people actually got on the windowsill and jumped. All they did was lose their money. Did they really think that by jumping they were going to help their family? How is mom going to explain that to the kids? So it is true of some. It's kind of like, and that's the prosperity doctrine. As long as you do this and do this and do this, you'll be my God. I'll praise you, man. You're going to get praise. This is where Jacob needed to get changed. He needed a name change because he was a supplanter. He was a manipulator. I love him. He's a patriarch and he changed by the grace of God. But in Genesis 28, it's like he said, if you do this and this and this, you're never going to hear the end of my praise. And God's like, what do I got to do? Do I got to come down and wrestle this moron in the dirt? Do I got to actually wrestle with him? And then what did he do? He didn't say, heal my hip. He didn't say, give me the healing. He walked with a limp the rest of his life. How about that for your healing ministries? He always walked with a limp. But what did he ask God to do? I'm not letting go of you till you bless me. Till you connect with me and I connect with you when we have a real relationship. And then he's like, you got it, kid. Your name is no longer Suplanta. It's Israel. God strives. You got it. Now, you know, you know what happened to him. It was awful. Little by little, Satan kept on coming back saying, wait, I need a little bit more. I need a little bit. Ten kids. Ten kids. Seven sons. Phew. Everything he saved. His whole life he saved, only to have it taken away. Could happen to you too. And then the sickness. No, nope, no, no pain medicine. Just potsherds. You read the story, it's unbelievable. I mean, as far as the Old Testament is concerned, this is the guy. 
This is the guy. Nobody went through what he went through. Look at his response. We sung about it. Job 1, 20, 21. Eov got up, tore his coat, shaved his head. Now, what does that say? Tearing the garment in Judaism is like tearing the heart. He was in deep, inconsolable mourning. If somebody loses a child, I'm begging you. Look at me. Do not go up to them and say he's dancing with Jesus. I'm begging you not to do that. You are going to kill that parent. Yes, there's a hope that he's with the Lord, but he's not with mom. Would it be so horrible to say, this is horrible. There's no consolation. And hug them and cry and say, I'm just unbelievably sorry. Would that kill you not to have an answer? The Bible says there's a time to mourn. So he's torn up. He shaves his head. He's, he loved his kids. But in the midst of his tremendous, inconsolable, inexplicable, over-the-top grief, he worships. Why? Your guess is as good as mine. But I'd have to say partly because whom do I have but you? Sometimes suffering lets you know. Some of us are a little too independent. I got this. Really? Well, you're a lot better than me because I never feel like I got this. I'll be doing this for 25 years, then 35, who knows? I'll never have this. Nope, it doesn't matter what you think. You might think, oh, he's anointed. So what? So what? God anoints me. He anointed a jackass. He could anoint me. <laughs> he's the anointer. You're the anointee. He's the gifter. You're the giftee. Your prayer didn't heal nobody, pal. Ain't no way. You don't have to run to Benny Hinn. You can go to Benny Honor and get healed <laughs> if God wants to heal you. By the way, to this day, there is not one documented medical miracle. Go figure. You know, anybody can jump up right now and say, Rabbi, I'm healed from this. Really? Show me. When Jeremy was healed, we took him to the hospital. He had anaphylactoid purpura. Three days later, he didn't have it. And it was documented. Documented. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb. Basically saying, I had nothing. You owed me nothing. I had nothing coming to me. Imagine that, having that attitude. God, you owe me nothing. My father was very hardcore. He'd say, you think I owe you something, kid? What do I owe you? I've loved you. I put a roof over your head. I sent you to school, clothes on your back. It sounds hardcore, but it, it teaches you that you're not entitled. And we can't stand that today, right? We, we can't stand the people that, are enti- that think, the takers, that think everything's coming to them. Hey, I got free education, you know. I got it through this and through that. It's unbelievable, right? Yes, it is unbelievable, pal. Because everywhere else, you don't get free education. You have to pay for it. If you can't pay for it, you don't get educated. If you can't afford a uniform, you don't go. So yes, it's unbelievable. But some of us that hate people that are entitled, we're entitled in the church. What's in it for me? What are they going to give me? Yeah. Takers. Takers. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb. God, you owe me nothing. And naked I'll return. I'll leave with nothing, right? Go to Tutankhamun's tomb, and what do you see? His priceless possessions are still there. I don't know he gave. I don't know he took. It's crazy. This is a tough one. This is a crazy witness. Because in the midst of this, he glorifies God, and the enemy is like, what the heck do I got to do to this guy to get him to... Now, he did have a breaking point. Job 38, he broke. I would have broke Job 1. I don't know about you. It wouldn't have taken me 37 chapters. Some of you are like, well, Rabbi, you're a little weak. Yeah, you would have broke Job 2. 
looking at a, another great in the New Testament would be, would be the great Apostle Paul. He was the model saint. There's no saint like him as far as a new covenant saint. There really isn't. I've met some overseas that are kind of like him. I really have. And, um, but nobody exactly like him. Class of his own. I mean, he calls himself the chief of sinners. He was also the chief of saints. He really was. Um, looking at Philippians 1.12, Philippians was a congregation, Philippi, a little congregation. They struggled and they suffered greatly. Greatly. And he's in prison. He's writing this from prison. And he says, now, brothers, I want you to know that what has happened to me has helped in advancing the good news. He was always concerned about people. People read 1 Corinthians and they see the great Rav Shaul. I'm not making fun. I'm just, I'm telling you. The great rabbi, the great teacher. Theology like nobody's business. Corinthians 1 is unbelievable. But Corinthians 2 is Pastor Paul. And a lot of people don't see that in him. They sometimes don't see that in people. They don't see the love that people have. Do you know how loving you have to be to be confronting? you know how loving? you know how loving you have to be to go out on a limb and have people hate you when there's no reason? I had a guy when I first moved here in Gold Gym, two big guys, I mean tremendous guys, come up to me and go, we freaking hate you, but we don't know why. And I said, you know, I could tell you, but I think you're going to hate me more. <laughs> And I did, and I made friends with one of the guys. We became very good friends. He was the craziest guy. He was one of the biggest drug runners, and he was the biggest guy you've ever seen. You know who I'm talking about. Shaved head, like, you know, deadlifts like 700 pounds, the biggest, the scariest guy, and we became friends. He became a believer, a very strong believer. In fact, I brought him to Mabel White that time. Remember, he was wearing all that black. He was the biggest guy. I mean, what was it, like 300, scariest guy. Sca you, you look at him, you just start crying. And I remember I went to Mabel White, and I was scared because I didn't know what to expect. It was the first time in the South, the whole thing. So I said, I just want you guys to know I brought my personal bodyguard with me. I said, so-and-so stand up. He stood up, and everybody, like, really liked me. But, um, <laughs> but I told him it was a spiritual thing. I told him, you're going to hate me, but you can either be a son of God or a son of the enemy. And the spirit in you, because he goes, I, you've not done anything wrong. You just walk around here and talk to people and talk to them about God, but we hate you. He said, you haven't really done anything wrong. I said, this, the spirit in you hates the spirit in me, but it doesn't hate me, and I don't hate you. Thank God he didn't kill me. <laughs> Thank God. But he was worried about people. You see he's worried? You could see this when he wrote to Timothy. He said, Timothy, I'm in prison. I'm freezing. Please, if you get a chance to visit here, can you bring me two things? Bring me a coat. So I'm freezing to death. And can you bring me some parchment? Because I still feel like the Lord wants me to write a couple of things. And then he says this, though. This is where you see his heart. Comma, he says, don't worry about me. Because Timothy was his son. And Timothy adored his dad. And he says, don't worry about me. I'm never alone. He was worried about Timothy while he's in prison getting persecuted. He's worried about Timothy. What a guy. Guys, that's, it's over the top. It's over the top. And he's doing the same thing now. He's like, I know you guys in Philippi are crying and praying and fasting. It's okay. The good news is going forward. What, what's the message, guys? He's encouraging others in his trial and his imprisonment. He's glorifying God and he's shutting down the enemy. He's saying, Paul's saying, don't dwell on the here and now. Push the kingdom forward. Don't dwell on what's going on. It doesn't matter. Push the kingdom forward. And it's crazy. When you have that attitude, the gospel of the kingdom gets furthered as opposed to hindered. It's amazing how God brings triumph out of tragedy. I mean, I hate this. I hate the Holocaust more than you know. But out of the ashes of the Holocaust came the beautiful nation of Israel. And, and, and a light switch went off. In 48, man, it went off. And in 67, another one went off. And there's another one yet. There's one more left when Yeshua comes to take his rightful throne and rule and reign in Jerusalem as the king of Israel. Those things had to happen because the Jewish people sitting left were never going to go. The only place the Jews haven't returned from, it's just, it's just logic, is America. Why do you want to leave? Do you know what the housing is there? Do you know what the poverty rate is there? 
When you go to Jamaica and you go to couples and you're having your couples massage, that's not Jamaica. I preached in Jamaica. When you go to the Bahamas or the British Virgin Islands, you think you're going to the Bahamas. I preached all over the British Virgin Islands. I'll show you poverty like you've never seen. It's a different ballgame. When you go to the Serengeti, you're going to the greatest safari in the world. But I'll take you about 10 miles from the Serengeti. It's a different ballgame. So it's unbelievable, man. It's unbelievable what God does, how he brings beauty out of ashes. It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, look at you. Look at all of you. Look at how he's beautifying you. You know it. Even you still make mistakes, I know, and you hate making the same mistake over again, right? But you're changing. Listen to me. If you're with the Lord and the Holy Spirit is moving in your life, don't let your mother, your father, don't let your husband, don't let your kids tell you you're the same. Because I can assure you, if you're working with the God that I'm working with, you are not the same. I promise you're not the same. Number three, and last one, suffering keeps, your, keeps swelling your feet so that earth's shoes won't fit. Wow. I, wish, I wish Imelda Marcos could have related to this. People are starving in the street right outside her palace and she's urinating in an 18 karat gold toilet. Now, I don't want to get on you, but some of us are just a little too worldly-minded. I am not saying that vacations, I'm not saying that fixing your home, I'm not saying that is bad. We're always going to be doing that. It's just, you know, it's just part of life. It doesn't mean you have to take a, a vow of poverty, and that means you're holy. A vow of poverty could mean you're poor, and poverty is a curse, unless God wants you to be poverty stricken. If God wants you, if you're going to be like a Mother Teresa, then God's called that. But understand, according to Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, poverty is considered a curse. Okay? There's nothing wrong. You don't, you don't pray for your kids. You don't go, I hope you grow up. I hope you don't go to college. I hope you get a really lousy job. And I hope you struggle. That's not God. By the same token, if, if wealth is your God, that's an issue too. But I'm just saying some of you love God so much, but you love the world just as much. And you have to come to grips with it. You must come to grips. If you want to pursue God, if you want to just, just kind of be saved, it's cool. It's cool. But understand what you think about, where you spend your time and where you spend your money, especially your thoughts, that's where you'll find your God. Yes. There's no question about it. If you're thinking about parting constantly, then you're, that's your God. Yes. Suffering keeps swelling your feet so that earth's shoes won't fit. Look at Colossians 3, 2 for a minute. I just got a few verses left. He says, focus your minds on the things above. Mind you, all these people were suffering, okay? Focus your minds on the things above, not on the things here on earth. Now, we can't relate to this too well because we're just the opposite. We live horizontally. We really do. That's why we love to lay down. We quit. We say, oh, Rabbi, what do you want me to do? Step down? No, Jack, you're like 46 years old. When are you going to step up? You just keep quitting. You can't win if you just quit. It doesn't work. Well, I'll just quit. I'll just, I'll just go to another church. I'll just, how many churches have you been to? I've been to two, and I would have been to one if God didn't yank me out of it. I would have stayed there unless God told me to go. It wasn't my idea, and it wasn't my idea to come. I apologized to Bernadette the other day. I said, I wasn't looking for this. This got me. I wasn't looking for it. I would have liked a nine to five. I have friends that work in the city. They work, they have a job. It's maybe not the greatest job, but pays the bills well enough. I had a job like that, and they come home, and their wife says, how was your day? And they go, yeah, it was okay, because how was the day? Same thing. And then they come home, and they play with the kids, and they have dinner, and they take the kids away from the wife, and they go outside a little bit while she's finishing up cooking, and they have a normal night. This is, it's not normal. I don't even, I'm not even sure it's the way God wanted it. I'm not sure. But every time I come home, it's like, how was your day? And I go, and then we start talking because I feel like Bernadette helped birth it. And it's, it's her baby too. And so I, I inform her because I just, it's one of those things. And so we talk about this place all the time. And my kids hear it all 
the time because we can't just run into a room. I'm just not like that. We got to talk. You want to talk at 815? And they hear it all the time. And there's been some incredible blessings. They met some beautiful people. You know, they really have, but they've seen things that they shouldn't have seen too. And it's, it's, it's bothersome to me. He's saying to live vertically. Can you, can you do me a favor? Can you hook this? Yeah, I know it was annoying you, and it was annoying me more. Thank you. He, he's saying to, to live vertically, and he's, he's saying that, you know, this was a lunatic. This was a lunatic. Paul was a lunatic. He was incredibly bright, incredibly devoted, would have done anything for God. It would have pleased him to no end to die as a martyr. He would have done that in a heartbeat. He was a lunatic. He was a God freak in every stretch and sense of the word, and he was an extreme obsessive person, as obsessive as they come. So this is what we're dealing with. So he's a hard act to follow, but nevertheless, this is what the Lord allowed him to write, and he wrote. So he's saying that we, we, we should pursue a deep, intimate relationship with the Lord. We should never be satisfied where we are. And, and he's saying not to, to do that, we have to not become overly occupied with the things of this world. And you know Yeshua said the same thing. He said you can't serve two gods. You'll love one and hate the other, or you'll hate this one and love the other. But you can't serve two gods, because you know you can't. You know a house divided against itself. It's not probable that it's going to fall. It will absolutely come down. Even, even your house, if you and your wife are divided and not going in the same direction, it's not like you always have to agree because Lord knows who can always agree with a woman, right? <laughs> it's not Mother's Day tomorrow, just saying. timing was excellent no you can't always agree and sometimes it's it's kind of irreconcilable sometimes one person just kind of has to give in right in order for it to but I'm just talking about when you're both pursuing God it's really hard it's really hard you get along fine and, and you hope somebody catches up but I know so many women that their husbands are just you know they care more about fishing and hunting than they do the Lord but they're there they come every now and then and I know sometimes the opposite Sometimes you get a guy who's on fire, and the girl's like, she's kind of there. She likes the God thing, you know, but not totally committed. And it's hard. It's just really difficult. But he's saying, you know, he's not saying the two of you should focus. The congregation should focus. He says, focus your individual mind. Focus your mind on the things above. We are citizens in heaven, and we're just passing through. I know that's really a hard concept. It's really a hard concept because we get very attached to this world. We get very attached to stuff. In the first century, they were more than happy to die because they were being persecuted so much, they wanted to be released from the persecution. We're so blessed that who wants to die? The only people that want to die are people that are incredibly depressed, and I understand. I'm not making fun. Emotional trauma is the worst trauma. It's way worse than physical pain. Way worse. But who wants to die? People love life, right? So what does that bring us to? Romans 8:18. It says, I don't think the suffering we are going through, meaning everybody was going through it. Guys, seriously, in the first century, every single solitary believer was persecuted, tormented, and abused. He said, he's saying to them, he's trying to encourage them, I don't think, I mean, it sounds so flippant, but he's saying, I don't think the suffering that we are going through now are even worth comparing. Like, no compa let's not even talk about it, with the glory that will be revealed to us in the future. Now, I know this is a hard concept. I'm not making fun of you. I'm in this world, too, and this world is tempting, and it keeps grabbing at you. It keeps grabbing at you. It's like, you know, you've been on 160 vacations. Well, I've never been to the Galapagos. It's just a bunch of birds, man. <laughs> Go to the Bronx Zoo. Go to the birdhouse. Have a beer. It's the same thing. <laughs> it's like it's all the same after a while. It all just looks the same. It's, it's not about going to Israel to see Israel. It's about connecting with the God of Israel and the Jewish people. Yeah. Yeshua is all about the people, not about the place. I don't think the suffering we are going through, it's crazy. What, what's wrong with you? He, he's talking about that he was totally looking forward, and his crew, his crew was totally looking forward to the resurrection of the body and the new heavens and the new earth. Yeah. They were absolutely zoned in on that. 
Absolutely. The only reason they were here, I mean, he wasn't just writing a nice letter like sometimes we, we write some nice things. We write some snippets on our little social pages and it's, oh, this is encouraging. This guy was saying, if I'm stuck here, stuck here, I will preach the gospel. I will preach the gospel and I will never stop. But man, would I like to drop dead and be with the Lord. That's what he said. That's what he said. I'm telling you what he said. It's hard for us to read this in America. It's such a, this is, this is not a Western mindset. A Western mindset says, Doc, do whatever you can. I don't want to die. Look at, look at, just look at what he was thinking about. He also wrote, you know, Thessalonians. Look at what he wrote in 1 Thessalonians. He wrote this to a congregation who were extremely being persecuted in Thessalonica. He says, now brothers, we want you to know the truth about those who have died. They were getting killed for their faith. Otherwise, you might become sad the way other people do who have nothing to hope for. So he's saying non-believers, they have no ho- it, there's no question that they would be sad. No hope. They'll never see him again. It's over. Game over. This life and that's it. He says, for since we believe, he's encouraging them. He says, since we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, we know he rose again, we also believe that in the same way God through Yeshua will take with him, those who have died. Meaning, he's the first fruits, but we're attached to the batch. So if he accepts the first fruits, he has to accept what's attached to the batch. We're rising too. We will not be dead forever. This was his absolute belief. That's what he was encouraging. That's why he wasn't afraid to die. And then we see in Revelation 22, 3, 4, the new heavens and the new earth. No longer will there be any curses. Do I need to go on? I mean, sometimes we curse ourselves with what we say. Sometimes we curse ourselves with what we do. It's not the enemy. It says there's no curse without a cause. We've done it. We've done it. But isn't that encouraging? No more curses. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city. And his servants will worship him. Now, if if you're bored with worship, you're going to be bored. They will see his face. Do we have to go on? And his name will be on their foot. Not literally, not like he's going to stamp you, but he, you're going to be his. You're going to be his. Now look at 2 Corinthians with me, another letter that the great wrote. Listen to this lunatic. For our light and transient troubles... are achieving for us an everlasting glory whose weight is beyond description. This guy was a master with words, and he says, I can't describe it. I don't have the words to describe what's waiting for us. Do you remember when he said later on, he said, I knew a man who went to the third heavens, which is the abode of God. Who do you think that man was? He was. But he wouldn't say it because he was so humble. And he said he saw things that he couldn't describe. What do you think? He ran into a man and some man said, I saw heaven. Baloney. He saw it. But he said, I can't, I can't even, it's so sacred, it's so amazing. I don't have the word. Can't talk about it. We concentrate not on what is seen, but on what is not seen. See, now we walk by faith. When he comes, we'll walk by sight. Since things seen are temporary. It's temporary, kid. I mean, I hate to break it to you, but, you know, it's temporary. I know we still feel great. You know, we still feel great. You know, we go to the funeral. Look at him. He, he, just yesterday he said he felt great. And today he's dead. It's not more than. It's just the way it is. Doesn't mean you shouldn't live your life and you shouldn't enjoy your life. I believe life is a banquet to be enjoyed. But enjoy it with the Lord. Enjoy it with the Lord. Things are temporary, but things that are not seen are eternal. So he's saying here, if I get it right, and it's pretty straightforward. He made things simple so we'd understand it. The harm that he's experiencing is not permanent, but the blessing is. How the heck could this guy say that his afflictions were light? They were, I don't think they were light, do you? I think they were bitter and cruel. Let me, let me show you in 2 Corinthians 11, when he has to get on his soapbox, which is such a shame, it's so sad 
because the people weren't submitting, they weren't following, and they were starting to follow somebody else. And he loved the people so much that he saw they were being steered away. I could come in here and just in 20 minutes give you just some motivational message. I could be a motivational speaker. I know I can. And I could just motivate you and split and burn it. And I can go out to lunch and just goof around and laugh. It'd be much easier for me, way easier. And everybody would love me. They would love me. Oh, he's so, he's so encouraging. He's the greatest guy. We got to bring more people in. We'd have 16 praise and worship teams. It'd be great. But that's not going to help you when the crap hits the fan. Some of you are in law enforcement. You train. And you better train seriously. Because the things you're training for can and do happen. And you must be prepared. Yeshua constantly said, be prepared. Be prepared. For what? Listen to how he had to get on his soapbox because they were being led astray, the Corinthians. There were some people coming in preaching another doctrine. And these poor people were being steered away from what he was preaching. And he didn't have the internet and they weren't around the corner. So he had to get a letter to them in a hurry. Listen to what he says. He goes, you think they're an apostle? I'm more of an apostle. He didn't want to say that. He's like, I sound like a jerk. I'm bragging. He hated this, but he had to do it to bring them back. He said, five times I received 40 lashes less one. Why? Because the Bible says in the Torah, no more than 39 lashes. So what they do is they take this three-tiered uh, leather strap. It wasn't, it wasn't the same flogging that Yeshua got. And they'd hit you two times in the back and one time in the chest. So they know three, multiple three, 13 times, it would be 39. And it, it ripped open your skin. He said, five times I've received that. You know the scars he had? There was no skin grafting. You imagine what he looked like with his shirt off? He said, three times I was beaten with rods. Rods, metal rods, hung upside down, hanging upside down, feet tied together, and they beat the bottom of your feet. Every metatarsal broken to bits. How do you think he walked? Do you think he had a nice gait? No orthopedic surgeons. No reconstructive surgery. Three times. Once I was stoned. What? They tied him up and threw rocks at him and he survived? What? How many scars do you think this guy had? Three times I was shipwrecked on some island. Was there any food? Was this? I don't know. Probably not. I wouldn't think. How long was there for? You got me. Maybe just had coconut water for three weeks. I don't know. I spent a night and a day in the open sea hanging onto a plank in the open sea? Some of you, you, you saw jaws, you wouldn't even go in a swimming pool. I mean, I go, I, I always, when I go down and visit a friend of mine where I used to live in Florida, I always swim, I swim the lifeguards. The sharks are out there. If you take a plane, a friend of mine put me in a plane, they're there. They're there. But do you realize you have, you know, Bernard was telling me, somebody was telling her, I just won't go in the ocean because there's sharks. Do you know you have a greater chance of dying and slipping in your shower? Do you shower? Do you ever tell your kids, be careful, don't die in that shower? I mean, it's kind of crazy, you know? But he was out in the open sea. No sunblock, no food, a whole day and a whole night hanging on. Was he cold? You tell me. In many travels, I have been exposed to danger. I've been in danger in the rivers. I've been in danger from robbers. I've been in danger from my own people, from the Jews. I've been in danger from the Gentiles. I was in danger when I was in the city. I was in danger in the desert. I was in danger at... Are you out of your mind? How could you then write that your, your trials was light and transient? You, you had to be a real freaking God nut. You had to be really sold out, pal. Danger from false brothers? Don't we know that one? Uh -huh. They smile in your face all the time. They want to take your place, the backstabbers. I have toiled and endured hardship. I've worked my butt off, he's saying. And yet still, not enough. We need more. We need more. The kids, Rabbi, there's 14 kids in one room and their chairs are kind of close. Really? What was the last mission trip you've been on? 
Let me show you the kids in Africa that sit in the dirt on top of each other. No complaints. Just happy to hear the word of God. No complaints. I have toiled and endured hardship often, not had enough sleep. How, how much sleep do you think you had? An hour here, an hour there? Paul, if you don't get your eight, you're not going to be any good. You're going to need an extra cup of latte in the morning. Paulie, I've been hungry, meaning he was starving. I've been thirsty. I've frequently gone without food, and I've been cold and naked. What? The Apostle Paul, the great Shaul, could say this because he compared this with heaven. He compared it with heaven. This is a guy who was persecuting believers and wanted so badly for God to take his head. He was embarrassed when he found out what he was doing. And he didn't want to go back to his people. He didn't want to go back to anyone. Totally embarrassed. Like, Peter, I'm going out in the water. What was he going to do? Throw, tie a millstone around his neck. Kill himself. I believe that. I believe he was going on a suicide mission. And I believe Paul was like, please take my head. I believe he leaned it out, and he was hoping that Yeshua was going, why do you persecute me? He's like, I'm done. I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm done. Yeah. And then as he's ready to take it, he's ready to take it like a man. Yeshua lifts up his chin and says, I love you. And that was enough to bury him. And then he said, okay, I'm going to pay you back. <laughs> You're going to be happy you saved me. And that's how he lived his life, crazy, crazy. And I want you to just see something else about this guy, just two more verses, 28, 29. He says, besides these external matters, meaning the beatings, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with the torture. Let me tell you what really bothers me. There is the daily pressure of anxious concern. Now, that's why you have to read in context, because some of you who just know some verses, like a fortune cookie will say, don't be anxious in anything. Didn't he say that, Rabbi? So is he two-faced? Is he, is, he, is he a hypocrite? The guy that said don't be anxious in anything is saying I'm anxious every day. In that context, these people are being persecuted in Philippi, so he's trying to encourage them. That doesn't mean he's a hypocrite. He had anxiety every day because he had all these people that he was responsible for, and if somebody fell into sin, it broke his heart. You have kids. Does it not break your heart when they take a route that is so dangerous? Or you know you can't do anything about it. You could. You'd cut off a finger to change it. But they're going a route that you know is going to cause them great pain. He felt this way about his congregation. Because he was a real shepherd. He cared. He said, who is weak without my sharing his weakness? The anxious concern for all the congregations. We have anxious concern, Brennan and I, for India. There's stuff going on there. I don't share all that stuff with you. Why? What are you going to do? There's stuff going on. There's stuff going on in Africa. There's stuff going on in Israel. There's stuff going on in Australia. There's stuff going on in the prisons. It's not all hunky-dory. There's stuff going on here. And you can't, you can't be overseer without seeing over it and having to deal with the stuff. That's why, please, I'm telling you, I'm begging you, don't fight me over the color of the carpet. Thank you. I don't have time for that, kid. I don't. And if I seem that I'm a little agitated about it, you know what? Good observation. I am. <laughs> Who falls into sin without my burning inside? I miss Molly. I miss Lisa Quigley. I miss Chris Fryer. I don't just go on. So he's saying, what shall our pain be like when Yeshua looks us in the eye and says, I'm so glad you're here. And then proceeds to place a crown of life on our head. By the way, there are people out there that say people that live for eternity are escapists. It's the furthest thing from the truth. Those who live for eternity end up doing the most for God in this life. That's the truth. Let me finish with a quote from Johnny Erickson Tata and Steve Estes. The book is called When God Weeps. It's page 202. 
Affliction is what fuels the furnace of this heaven-hearted hope. People whose lives are unscathed by affliction have a less energetic hope. Oh, they are glad to know they are going to heaven. For them, accepting Jesus was a guarantee of no hell and heaven, like a buy and sell agreement. Place your sins on the counter and get an asbestos-lined soul. Once that's taken care of, they feel they can get back to life as usual, dating and marrying, working and vacationing, spending and saving. But suffering makes the Christian experience more than signing the dotted line on an eternal health care contract. Suffering gives the covenant life. It turns our hearts towards the future, like a mother turning the face of a child, insisting, look this way, kid, look this way. Once heaven has our attention, a fervid anticipation for God's ultimate reality, appearing with him in glory, begins to glow, making everything earthly pale in comparison. Earth's pain keeps crushing our hopes, reminding us this world can never satisfy, only heaven can. And every time we begin to nestle too comfortably on this planet, God cracks open the locks of the dam to allow an ice-cold splash of suffering to wake us from our spiritual slumber. You won't hear this at Joel's place. They don't fly in on private planes on a landing strip to sit in the front row to hear this crap. Mm -mm. Nope. Nope, today it's the gospel according to Shaka Khan. Yes. Yes. Tell me something good. I'm telling you something great. I'm telling you, by the grace of God, you were pulled out of the freaking pit. You did nothing to deserve it. Why you and not her, I don't know, but it happened. And you should never, ever forget to thank God. He should never, ever hear the end of it. You did nothing to deserve it. In fact, if he analyzed you and me, he had no reason to do it. He should have kicked us in the pants with our attitude, our thankless, malcontented selfishness that nothing's good. Nothing's good. He took the form of a man. A man became a baby, nestled at his mother's breast, got his diapers changed, God, and then got himself mutilated and gave himself up and said, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? Why am I going through this? Where are you? I don't understand. And all for what? Love. Yes, sir. Love. Because wow. God wants to be with his creation forever. It was a total preemptive strike. He totally nailed the enemy. We are truly saved. And we should start being all the more thankful. Because life could change in a heartbeat, sweet pea. In a heartbeat. Tomorrow, um, the world kind of, at least in America, celebrates Father's Day. I think it's really nice that they designated a day. There's a reason for it. It took like 100 years after Mother's Day to get this thing signed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure why, but I think the reason is, guys, and hear me, especially the men, sometimes you guys put up way too hard of an exterior. Yes. Nobody's that tough. And, and you struggle with being married because you, you just can't understand Sometimes how your wife works or thinks and you struggle with being a dad and you work so hard you want to be the great dad but you don't want to tell anybody you're struggling because you're too tough to tell somebody that. But the fact of the matter is we all are and if you were able to tell somebody that then they'd go, me too. And then somebody else would go, me too. And then you wouldn't feel like such a freak because it's hard. Being a dad is really hard. You know, we, just maternal instincts, it's just amazing. A little girl has a baby and she knows what to do. The guy's like looking for the directions. Um, but I want you to have a, a really great day. Um, I have something special that I'm going to do. I, I really want you to keep it in prayer. I really think it's the Lord. Um, he opened the door for me uh, just on Friday at 147. I was waiting for a couple of weeks to go to Pulaski to visit with the women. They have no father. And I see my kids every day. And plus, who the heck wants that stupid tie they buy me every year anyway? <laughs> um, but I'm going to go there and visit with women who have been incredibly abused and hurt and have no father figure in their life. And I just wish you would pray for me and just hope that it's a time that they can just 
feel good for a change. That's all I want to do. I don't have a message. I just want to spend some time with them and maybe help them feel good for a little bit. So that's what I'm going to do for Father's Day, and I'm incredibly, incredibly excited about it. So um, next week we will continue uh, one more week because I don't think we could take much more than that. Um, <laughs> one more week, but uh, it's going to be um, a great message. Uh, it's going to be much more uplifting, and I think you're going to leave here in the, in the grand scheme of things, in the final analysis, feeling like you're the luckiest beggars on earth. Okay? Let's stand together. If you uh, have a dad, you're very fortunate. It's a, it's a fatherless society. 50% of kids are born out of wedlock, and I'm not insinuating, but if you have a dad, you're blessed. I miss my dad a lot. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. Yivarecha Ananoi, ve Yishmarecha. Yo Ananoi Ponove Lecha, ve Hunecha. Yisa Adonoi Ponove Lecha, ve Asem Lecha. Shalom. I love you guys. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>